Let's begin with prayer. And that's always a good place to start, isn't it? Lord, thank you for this morning, Lord, for, oh, just for being here with, with my friends. How we've longed for this and how much we've missed this. It's like a breath of fresh air for us to just come and be with other women, talk a little, share ideas and thoughts to study your word together. Thank you for this. We're thankful to Pastor Ken and to Melinda and to Mary Elizabeth for all of those that have worked so hard to put this together for us. And Lord, we're just going to bask in your word this morning. Teach us, show us, Holy Spirit, what you would have us know today. That we walk out of here not with only facts in our mind, but with, with an understanding, Lord, more of who we are and who you are and your goodness. Lord, would you bless our time together this morning as, as, we, as we learn from you. In your name, amen. Um, I have to tell you, I, I touched on this a little bit. Well, I, I, I did a, a, a teaching um, last March, the, the day before we got shut down for COVID. And I did this teaching over in a women's um, retreat, one day retreat over at Gloucester Point Baptist Church. So I have to forgive me to my Gloucester Point Baptist friends, um, Christy and Donna, and, I, and if you guys have heard this before, just bear with me. I think it w it's just, uh, there was a lot of studying that went into it, and it just bears repeating a little bit uh, today because we're right in the middle of Genesis 2. Um, you okay with me there? You all right with me? All right, turn over to Genesis 2. I want to, I want to first, before we get into that, I want to explain, we talked uh, originally about the covenants, the, um, yeah, and I gave you a handout, if you need one, I think Melinda has some extras, but I gave you a handout of the different covenants in the Bible, and that goes along with the different dispensations or time eras of what the Lord was trying to accomplish in that time frame, and the first one we looked at, we're going to have look at four of them here in in this class over the next uh, what 28 weeks, I guess we have. We're going to look at four of them that are in Genesis. But the first one we touched on last week, it was called the Eden Covenant, or if you want to be real fancy, like a Bible scholar, it's the Edenic Covenant, and that was the covenant that of innocence is is in the dispensation of innocence that was before the fall. And we covered just a little bit of it last week where, where the Lord said to them, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, uh, take care of the earth. Subduing means to take care, to, to protect it, to, um, to, to correspond with it, to, be, to take care of the earth and name the animals and that I am giving you dominion, and that's the key word, I'm giving you dominion over this earth. Now the second part of that covenant comes in chapter 2, when we get, uh, it's a, it's a this, chapter 1 is the seven days of creation, and the six days, and then the seventh day the Lord rested. And then chapter 2 is kind of, we're honing in a little bit, on this creation and specifically on the creation of man and woman. I'm so glad that the Lord put chapter two in there because it so explains what on earth we're doing here. And um, that second part of the covenant or that, that Eden Edenic covenant comes when he says, He says, uh, go and the man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. That's part of it. They will become one flesh. 
another part of it is that they, um, that they, he put them together and brought woman out of man. Now, that is such a picture. Uh, it's a forethought, a forepicture of what was to come in that Eden covenant. The Lord knew that there was coming a fall. The Lord knew man's propensity to sin. He knew it. It blows me away that he still created them. Why did he do that? Why did he do that? Any ideas? He wanted a family. He wanted a family. He, and Sandra said it this morning. He wanted to not have puppets that would just do his bidding. He wanted somebody that loved him and appreciated him because of who he was. A voluntary love. And that tree was put in the middle of that garden. Of, of the tree of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil. Because God has always, always will give us a choice. What's ironic is when he gives us a choice and we choose the wrong thing, then we turn around and blame him. God, why did you make that happen? Why did this person die? Why did you do this? Why is there so much hatefulness in the world? Well, the world has hatefulness in it because we brought it in. It was our choice. Death is in the world because we brought it in. We, speaking of mankind, brought that in. God gave them that choice so that they would choose him. It's like, um, I guess it's in, in, in Deuteronomy that Moses said, this is, you have a choice. You, choose, you either choose death or you choose life. Choose life. Choose life. There's blessings over here. There's cursings over here, but there's blessings here. Choose life. Okay. I'm reading about the Israelites right now. How did they came back from bondage? Mm -hmm. And it talks about how God said, if things were okay, I will have all this stuff to give you and your life would be wonderful. And I want to tell you it overwhelmed me. And I thought, well, this is, but now I understand what's going on. Sure. Mm -hmm. It all comes together from, from the first of the book to the end. You'll notice, you'll notice that everything that God does from the time of the fall on was to bring people back into fellowship with him, bring them back. And sometimes ladies like our parents punished us when we, when we disobeyed or when we did something that was wrong or when we were in rebellion. They took away a privilege or something like that. And that's called parenting. And God did, did that with the children of Israel. He does that with us. He says, if, if I don't discipline you, you're not mine. So he's going to discipline us and help us understand this is the right way. This is life and this is death. Choose life. Are you with me? All right. So here we have, um, we're after the fall. We have the Adamic covenant, the, the Adam covenant. This is the age of conscience. And it's going on even to now. Um, where we have, it's, it's, a, it's part of the curse that you will leave this, this place of Eden. You will go out, you will have toil, and you'll have sweat on your brow. The, the land is going to produce for you, but it's going to be hard work. You're going to have thorns, you're going to have thistles. Women, you're going to have trouble in labor and in childbirth. That's all part of that covenant. However, right in the middle of all of that, he puts the promise of the covenant. Oh, Eve, one day, girl, you're going to have in your seed, you're going to have someone 
that comes along and this serpent, Satan, is going to bruise his heel. But then he's going to crush his head. God is going to crush his head. And it's talking about that day uh, when Jesus was on the cross. That death, that, that, that death came along um, and he said, it is finished. At that moment, Satan, that serpent of old, bruised his heel. But three days later, whew, he crushed Satan's head when he rose. Amen. It's beautiful. That covenant is absolutely beautiful. That even, even in the, even in the, the, the curse, and you notice, just as a, uh, something is just to think about, that curse was not necessarily, he did not curse man and woman. He cursed the ground. He cursed the serpent. And he, he made it so that man and woman had the effects of sin. And they, would, and they did die. They died because they ate from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was the reper repercussion of that. In the middle of that curse, a promise, a redemptive promise, come back, come back. I've got you. Isn't that beautiful? So let's drop back into um, a little bit uh, well, let's see what I got here. We we looked at that last week, the, or two weeks ago, this, the different dispensations, time frames. And the Adamic covenant is an unconditional covenant. The Lord set it in motion, and it wasn't conditional upon man's actions. I am sending a Redeemer. I am sending a Savior to you. The consist, it consists of the curse and the promise. And the covenant was a way of life for outside the garden. And it's still in effect today. We're still dealing with those childbirth pains and still want to be the boss in our home. You know, the husband type thing. And, you know, in the, um, in the, in the old King James Version, it said your desire will be for your husband. And I thought for years that that meant a sexual desire. And I was like, er. But the more I've studied that, the more I've read it, that is a desire for control in the home. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that and drop back into, the, into um, chapter 2 when we look at Adam and Eve being formed. Eve, or first Adam, you notice that the Lord spoke into existence everything up to the point that he created Adam. When he created Adam, he formed him. And there is a, a, a word, a Hebrew word in, in that for that word formed that is different from what he did. He speak to the, to the, to the animals and they came about. He formed him. He made him. He breathed in him the breath of life, the wind. The, it, we called it last week the Ruach, R-U-A-C-H, the Ruach. Um, in the New Testament, in the Greek, it's called the pneumo, which is where we get the word pneumonia, not able to breathe. The pneumo, the, the wind of God, is the breath that he breathed into Adam. Can you imagine that we, we are so caught up right now with breathing. We can't breathe on somebody. We have to wear these shields because particles that we cannot see come into the atmosphere and can, and can infect somebody else. It's the same. Can you imagine when God breathed into Adam that those particles went into Adam, the very DNA of God went into that man's lungs and jump-started him. Whew! That's kind of awesome, isn't it? 
Now, when he created Eve, he used a different word. When he, he, didn't, he didn't form him, her, it, the word is called banak, B-A-N-A-C-H, banak, and it means to build, to structure. It's different because what the first word formed means dust refined. When he built women, it's actually dust double refined. Come on. (laughs) Come on. That's good. I'm going to take that to the bank. Dust double refined. And can you imagine just Go back to the garden with me. He didn't breathe into Eve because what he did instead is he gave Adam this job of naming all the animals. And I think the reason that he did that, number one, is to keep Adam busy. But, and number two is because Adam started looking at, well, there's two rhinoceroses. They're a little different. There's, there's two snakes over here. There's two butterflies, there's two of this, there's two of that. And he began to feel inside him the loneliness. Sometimes God will meet a need before we see the need. That time that we're on our way across the river and there's an accident like one minute before we get there. The Lord saw that need and... and Made us a little late, maybe. He does that. He directs our paths all the time. His purposes are are always in foremost with us. I have a purpose for Candace. She's not going to die today. It's not her time. Her purposes on this planet need to be fulfilled, and then I'll take her. Those are the things that we don't see. But many times the Lord God will bring us to a place where we see our need and that loneliness, that vacuum, that emptiness is created in us for good reason. And as Americans, we're so comfortable with ourselves and with everything around us that if we have a need, we just get a little jangled. (laughs) Am, Am I right? We get a little jangled. We don't, you know, we live in this instant, I got to have this, you know, instant everything. But the Lord let Adam see that need and start having a desire. And then he put that holy anesthetic into him. Put him to sleep. And in that theater of the garden, he began to do surgery. Cut that, that, that side of that man and pulled that rib out. Now, ladies, I don't believe that that rib was dry. I believe it had flesh and blood attached to it. And then he began to form and build that woman out of that rib, sewed him back up. It is a picture, ladies, of Christ when he was on that cross saying, it is finished, and then piercing his side. He was under the holy anesthetic of death, piercing his side. And that blood and the water came out and was birthed the church of Jesus Christ, his bride. Amen? Does that make sense? That's the correlation. That's the Adamic or the Edenic covenant in motion, even today. So it, go with me to this garden that Eve is laying in the grass that she is completely built, stacked, perfect. She has no need of a wedding dress that day because she was absolutely in perfection. She didn't need any music for her wedding because the birds in Eden were singing. 
they all they they didn't need a photographer because all of all of creation witnessed that day and when she opened her eyes for the first time the first person that she saw was God her father the one who loved her the one who built her he reached down said come on my daughter I've got something good for you and on the arm of her father God she was taken up that aisle in that in that Eden garden and and Adam's response was whoa man <laughs> he's just and I could just I could just hear him almost bursting into tears and and touching his side this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh and the Lord said to them as part of the wedding vows to Adam you'll leave and he's speaking to all mankind because Adam did not have a natural father. Adam, you'll leave your father and your mother and cling to your wife, and you two shall be one. Isn't that beautiful? That first wedding. Now, what happened after that, I mean, they, it was precious, that, that time. And, and I said last week, I'm not sure how long that time of innocence lasted. The Bible is not um, specific on that. But we do know at some point that that scepter, that, see, Eve was the crowning end of creation. She was the last thing that was created. She was the crown. She had everything. She had the perfect looks, perfect body. Oh, come on. Come on. We could only dream of that. She had everything. She had the adoration of her husband. She had equality. She had everything. And she was as smart as him. And she, she instead, when she's had that conversation with the serpent... And he says, did God really say you can't eat of this tree? He only did that because he knows that you'll be as smart as him. She dropped the scepter that God had given her and reached for God's scepter. And ever since then, ladies, women have tried to reach for that scepter in everything that they do. They lost their identity that day. Women, and you can see it throughout history, women have been man's concubine. Women have been man's boss, his, his worst nightmare. He's, they've been his, his helpmate. They've been everything. They're just all over the map. They've been so uh, seductive. They've just been everything to try to find that identity again. And Christ brought that identity back to them on the cross. This is who you are. This is who I fashioned and formed and built you to be. You're mine. We have gone through generations just in our lifetime of things like women's liberation, burning bras, saying I, I, when children are no good, we're going to work all the time. And, and we, now they're coming back full circle that, that women are um, valuing their children, staying home a little bit more. It's, it's a change in culture, but you can see the waves, the dynamics of women not knowing exactly where they fit, where they are. Can I tell you, when we connect with Jesus, we know exactly where we fit. He's got us. We're his. We're his. And ladies, you could find your identity 
in so many different things, and so many of us have done this, I've done this, find my identity in my job. Some of us find our identities in our kids. I'm, I'm this person's, I'm, I'm this, my husband's wife. I can find identity in my ministry. I can find that, and we search for that identity everywhere. Come on, have, have any of you done this? Well, I'm so-and-so's wife. I'm so-and-so's mom. Yeah? Can I tell you that that search for identity ends when, when we come to Christ? Because he is our identity. He's the one that makes us whole again. Oh, ladies, I could go on. I could preach another two hours on that. But I do want to just kind of just kind of ponder that and leave that for you to think about. Where is your identity? What is your identity? It is the hardest thing in the world not to attach your identity to a project. Especially if you have a passion for that project. It's the hardest thing in the world not to attach your identity to somebody that you love. And, that, and I'm not saying that that, I mean, when the Lord put you together, he made you one. He made you one. But at the same time, your husband is not your identity. Christ has given you your own identity. You're to love him. You're to be a helpmate to him. You're to be that easer we talked about to him. And... You know, by the way, we think that somewhere in our culture we got the idea that that easer, that helper, that helpmate is kind of wishy-washy and not very strong. It's kind of, yeah, I have no plans of my own, so I'll just help. But that word literally means to surround and protect. It's a military term. That it, can you, And can you see it? Have you surrounded and protect your kids when somebody misabused them? When somebody was mean to them? That easer in you rises up and surrounds and protects your kids. That's the easer, the helper. That sound, surrounds and protects your husband when, when you know, some little boo-boo in a short dress goes, ah, you know, you stand in front and say, oh no, he's mine, back away. That's that easer, rising up and protecting. It is not a position of weakness. It is a position of extreme strength, ladies. You got it in you. The Lord put it there. He instilled it into you. So that identity. And, you know, Ephesians talks about this. When it... In Ephesians 6, when he talks about the, the identity or the helmet of salvation, that helmet was a, Ro a Roman soldier's helmet that had a crest on it that identified that he was part of that Roman army. Everybody knew that soldier from that helmet, from that crest, that emblem on him, who he belonged to, and fear was it. <laughs> It followed that identification because that was a, the army of the Roman army was a bad bunch. They were, they were extremely powerful. That emblem showed everybody in the army who he was. It was an emblem for, the, for their own. Everybody knows that I belong to Christ because I carry his emblem right here. Everyone knows that you belong to Christ. You carry that emblem. It's, you've heard of the mark of the beast? It's a counterfeit. This is the mark of God. Revelation talks about that, the mark of God. The, uh, that emblem identified them to their enemy. 
And you better believe the enemy can understand and knows what that emblem of Christ in you means. And he's afraid of it. You don't have to go running out there without your helmet on into a war, ladies. You got to keep that on. And let your identity align itself with Christ. You belong to him. Amen? All right. Like I said, I could go on and on on this one because I'm so excited about this one. But um, let's stop there and we'll go into it a little bit deeper next week when we uh, go into chapters four. And do we do four and five or just four? Four through six. Okay. We're in it now. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for what you're doing here, God, for for just for that identity. Lord, we trade the confusion in our lives for, for, for you. We don't want your scepter, Lord, but you have already designed us for a specific purpose and a specific plan and our identity. Our backs become straight today in knowledge of who we are in you. In your name. Amen.